Oh, well, I'm good. I'm glad to see everybody tonight. Glad that you're here. As always, I hope that you got your Bible with you, and if you do, you might open to the book of Matthew. We've been studying from Matthew, of course, the last few nights. Last night, we looked at Matthew chapter 9. Tomorrow night, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 20, where James and John asked Jesus to make them his left and right lieutenants. That's the way I paraphrase it, or that's the way I see that. And They want... Uh, Jesus to help put them in charge. They want to do big things for Jesus. And so we might think about that a little bit tomorrow evening. Tonight we're going to look at Matthew chapter 11. And like we did before, uh, like we did last night, I, I'm, I'm convinced, I really am, and I, ho I hope that uh, the way that I'm presenting these lessons, the way that we're going through this, I hope that this, this comes across, that the power, uh, the, the power that changes people's lives is not in the speaker. The power that changes people's lives is, lives is in the gospel itself. It's in the, it's in the message of Scripture. And if we just read through the Scripture, if we see what's being said by the authors of the Scriptures, I, I, I th that's, that's where the power is. And I think that that's our responsibility as speakers. That's our responsibility as Bible class teachers or, or as preachers or as, as shepherds of the church. Uh, it, it's simply to communicate, to stand behind the cross. That's an old saying, but, but stand behind the cross and, and just present the gospel to people, present the message of Scripture to people. I, I think that that will really change people's lives if we can do that. And, and I, I think of these as uh, they're simple truths. Um, that doesn't mean that uh, that I saw them the first time that I read through them, and maybe you haven't seen them when you've read through these, and maybe you've read through these chapters many times before, and maybe some of these things you hadn't quite made these connections in the past. Well, I, I hadn't made these connections either, but then when you see them, it's almost like, well, I don't know how I missed it all these times. I, I think there's something like that in, in Matthew chapter 11. And so I'd like to walk through that chapter again with you tonight, and we're going to talk a little bit about John the Baptist. And so if you want to take your Bible and open to the book of Matthew, once again, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 11, like I said. And I want to begin with a sort of a question for you. Matthew chapter 11, and there's a question that I want to begin with. Uh, of course, tonight's lesson is just entitled, "What uh, th This Isn't What I Expected. Have you ever, have you ever had that feeling? Have you ever had the feeling that things just aren't working out the way that they were supposed to? And I know that there are lots of people in the Scriptures that, that this happened with. Think about somebody like Abraham. Have you heard this phrase before? God helps those that help themselves. Have you heard that? I don't know how many times I've had other Christians tell me that. I'm wrestling with this, something. I'm struggling with something. God helps those that help themselves. Do you remember the promise that God made to Abraham? Abraham's an old man even at that moment, and God comes to him and he has, a, he has a promise for him. That it's not going to be a slave that was born in his house that's going to be his heir, but someone that's born from himself, from Abraham. Abraham is going to father a son. Abraham's, Abraham's already 75 years old, and God's making these promises to him. And it's still another 25 years before these promises are fulfilled. And throughout that span of time, I, I, I might suggest that Abraham gets this notion as well, or at least his wife does. Maybe God's waiting for us to do our part. Things aren't working out the way that we thought they were supposed to. I assume when God made this promise that within a year or two at least, these things were going to start to fall into place. But here we go, year after year, and nothing seems to change. Maybe it's because God helps those that help themselves. Just by the way, that's not a biblical proverb. Things just haven't worked out the way that I thought they were going to. Or, or somebody like Elijah. I, I, I so appreciate the story of Elijah. Sometimes Christians get down on Elijah because Elijah's down, and I, I think that's unfair. I really do. Think about what happens with Elijah. So Elijah goes up on top of the mountain. He's above all the people. Here is the pulpit of Israel. And Elijah and the prophets of Baal are all on top of the mountain to determine who is the living God. And he'll answer by fire. And God does. God rains down fire and consumes not only the sacrifice, but the altar and laps up the water and the earth around it. Is there any question 
who is in charge in Israel? There's no doubt. There's no doubt. God answers. No one can deny it. And then just a chapter later, Elijah's in a cave and he's discouraged and he's depressed and he prays to God, God, just, just take my life too. There's no point for me to live. They've killed your prophets. I'm the only one that's left. And we get down on Elijah for feeling that way. Why does he feel that way when he's just succeeded? He's just had this great victory on top of the mountain in the sight of all the people. So why is he now discouraged, deflated, dispirited? Because nothing changed. Nothing changed. Ahab and Jezebel are still in charge. Jezebel's still spouting threats and she means to carry them out. That's why he's hiding. Nothing changed. God answered. Nobody could deny it. And yet nothing really changed in Israel. Wouldn't you be discouraged? Wouldn't you be defeated? Wouldn't you feel just a little bit like there's really no point in carrying on when the greatest victory of your life is just washed away because nothing changed? It's just not worked out the way that I thought it was going to. When I was a little boy, some of you, if you think back, think back in your memory, what did you want to be when you were a little boy or a little girl? When I was just real small, uh, we lived just, I don't know, maybe a, a couple miles down the road from my grandpa and grandma, and grandpa would come down and he'd pick me up on the tractor and we'd go off and we'd, I'd, I'd ride the tractor, I suppose we'd, we went and plowed fields together or harvested together. One of my favorite things to do was to climb up in the cab and sit there with grandpa and the harvester. I, I dreamed that one day I was going to grow up and I was going to raise corn and cattle like my grandpa. I wanted to be able to farm with my grandpa. I'd buy my own little place, but we'd farm together. And that's just, that's just what I was going to do. And, uh, and then we moved away. And I didn't get to farm with grandpa. But then I was convinced that I was going to join the Marine Corps because my dad was a Marine. And I was so proud of my dad. And I wanted to be like my dad. And so I was going to join the Marine Corps too. And dad wasn't so fond of me joining the Marine Corps. And so that didn't get very far. I had all of these plans. Maybe you can imagine the plans or remember the plans that you had. Maybe plans that you had in high school and you just knew that your life was just going to, it was just going to go in this straight direction, this upward trajectory, and it was just going to work out this way. And, and you just had all of these goals and you just had this timeline and everything was just going to fall into place. How'd that work out? Didn't work out so well, did it? Now, I will admit this. I will admit this. The man that I am today, and I, I believe that I'm not unique in this, I think everyone here probably can identify with this very feeling. The man that I am today, it is not anywhere near what I thought I was going to be when I was 5, 10, 15, when I was 20, even when I was 25. The man that I am today, where I am in life is not where I thought I was going to be. But, but I'm not disappointed in where I am. Um, and this is just a bit of an aside. Uh, I am thoroughly amazed now that I'm middle-aged to look back and be able to see that even in my missteps and in many of the things that I have done foolishly, that God is still able to rework those things and make something good out of them. He can take all the mess that I have created and he can still, he can still create something good out of it. I'm so thankful for him in that way. I think there's a lot of people that can identify with that. Is your life where you thought it was going to be? Have things worked out the way that you thought they were going to work out? I don't know, some of you ladies out there, do you ever get on this, this website? I don't, is it a website or an app or whatever this thing is? This symbol, you ever been on there? Have you seen these kind of things on there? Maybe you save these kind of things. When you bake this stuff, you follow the recipe, right? Does it ever turn out that way? 
Does it ever look like that when you get done with it? If so, talk to me later. <laughs> I'd like proof tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, all the, you, can fo- you can follow the rules. I remember, I, I remember distinctly thinking this, not about making cookies, but, but I can distinctly remember this about things in life, thinking I followed all the rules. I did it all right. I did everything the way it was supposed to be done, and it didn't work out. Why didn't it work out? I share this little story. I'll share this little thing with you. You're, a couple years ago, my brothers and my dad, we all got on our motorcycles and we, we rode out west. And we, we passed through South Dakota and we, we, we rode out into Wyoming and around Colorado and we made some stops in Montana and Idaho and, and came back across Missouri. And, and we left out the last day. We left out of Kansas City on the Kansas side. And I rode almost a thousand miles. I think I was like 40 miles short of being a thousand miles on the motorcycle that day. Uh, I was hurting pretty bad because <laughs> we'd already done 4,000 miles in the last couple of days before that. So, but a thousand miles with nobody else to talk to but God. And I'm arguing with Him. I'm arguing with Him. I'm mad at Him. I don't understand why things are the way that they are. And, and I, I can remember distinctly telling God, I thought I, 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 I ask you for bread and you've given me, I, I, I've asked for bread and you've given me rocks. You've given me rocks to eat. I've asked for fish and you've given me snakes. You know, the stuff from Matthew. Have things worked out the way that you thought they were going to? There are people in the Bible that assume things were going to work a certain way and they didn't. I think we see that in someone like John. Now, here in Matthew, Matthew's beginning a new section. So we've kind of skipped around a little bit. We looked at chapter, what, 16, 17, uh, 18, 19 on Sunday night. Uh, Last night we went back to chapter 9. Tonight's chapter 11, and then we're going to talk about chapter 20. Uh, So there's a new section uh, that that these verses begin. it, it, and I'm, I'm just kind of give you an overview of what's happening in Matthew. So Matthew chapter 11 and Matthew chapter 12 are some examples of belief and some examples of disbelief. And then chapter 13 is one of these sections of speech. So in, in the Gospel of Matthew, there are five major speeches that Jesus makes, like Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, at the end of the Gospel like chapter 22, chapter 20, uh, 20, 23, 24, and 25 is this speech about judgment. So he pronounces judgment on the, 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 the scribes and Pharisees. He pronounces judgment on Jerusalem. And then he gives this, these parables of judgment in chapter 25. Well, Matthew chapter 13 is a section of parables. And they all explain why people respond the way that they do. Disbelief or belief. And again, just, just one other thing I want to throw in here for you. The first parable is the parable of the sower. It's, it's sort of the template for understanding all the other parables that come afterwards. But it's called the parable of the sower. Why is it called the parable of the sower? Why is it called the parable of the sower? I think that's really confusing. Because we all know, as we've studied that story before, that, that it's the same sower that sows on all the soil. And he sows the same seed. That doesn't make any difference. What makes the difference in the harvest? The soil. Right? So why not call it the parable of the soils? The soil is what makes the difference. Why call it the parable of the sower? Well, because the Bible calls it that, number one. But I think Jesus calls it the parable of the sower because it's meant... It's meant for people who go out and sow the seed. Don't be discouraged. When you sow the seed and none of it grows, you keep sowing seed. Wouldn't you be discouraged? Wouldn't you need somebody like Jesus to encourage you? You keep sowing the seed. I keep sowing the seed, Jesus, but nobody's listening. Nobody's hearing it. it. Nothing's changing. 
if you sow the seed and you sow it and it falls on the wayside the entire your entire life if you sow seed all your life and it only falls on the wayside have you failed you have not failed you have done just what Jesus asked you to do. Sow seed. It's not your fault that it falls on the road. It's not your fault that it falls among the thorns or in the, gra the, the rocky soil. Your job is just to sow the seed. Keep sowing seed, no matter if it grows or not. And so there's this parable to encourage people, even when the results are disbelief, Keep sowing the seed. And then chapter 14, 15, and 16 is a second set of reactions that culminates in, G in Peter's confession, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So Matthew chapter 11 begins with John's question. Matthew chapter 11, and verse 2 and 3. If you want to read this with me, Matthew chapter 11, verse 2 and, and verse 3. Now when John, while he was in prison, heard, that, uh, heard of the works of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the expected one, or shall we look for someone else? So John asks a question. Now, now John knows Jesus really well, right? They're cousins. But more than that, John, the one who's asking this, Are you the expected one? Are you the Christ? Are you our Messiah? Are you the son of David? Are you the one we've been waiting for? Or should we look for somebody else? This same John, in this same gospel, in Matthew, back in chapter 3, says this. Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? And in John's Gospel, John chapter 1, I don't know if you can read this, but this is John chapter 1 and verse 29 through 34. The next day he saw, that's John, John saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God. The one who's asking, Are you the expected one? is the same one who has said, This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is he on behalf of whom I said, After me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. And I didn't recognize him, but in order that he might be manifest to Israel, I came baptizing in water. And John bore witness, saying, I have beheld the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. And I didn't recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, he upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remain upon Him, this is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and I have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Now that's what John has professed. John says, I saw it, I heard it from the Lord, I know it, and I've preached it. That's what John's professed. Now here in Matthew chapter 11, John's asking, are you the expected one or should we look for someone else? So why the question? Now some people think it's because John is sending his disciples so that they can hear Jesus proclaim it himself. Uh, if, that's how, if that's how you read this, just walk through this with me, but I'm, I'm going to beg to disagree with you. I don't think that that's what's happening. Um, I think what's happening is that John is beat down and John is discouraged. Notice that Jesus responds not to the disciples, but to John. Go tell John. This answer is for John. This question is John's question, sincere question. Are you really the expected one? Because I'll tell you what, Jesus, things aren't working out the way that I thought they were going to. Remember, John, John has likely been in prison for nearly a year at this point. He has languished in prison for nearly a year, and you know as well as I do that he's not getting out in one piece. 
Things haven't worked out the way that John thought they were going to. I, I think John has doubts. Have you ever had doubts? Have you ever had doubts about your faith? What you were sure and convinced of? What you've told other people with, with, as, as much, with the, as much fervor and conviction as you could muster? Have you ever had doubts? I'm, I'm not ashamed to tell you I've had doubts. I, I confess to you that I argued with God, that I've wrestled with God, that I fight with God, that I've been mad at God. Not because He's wrong, but because I don't understand. And I think that that's what John is experiencing. John is beginning to have doubts. Like I said, he's been languishing in prison since chapter 4. This has been nearly a year. And I think John is just saying, there, there must be some discrepancy between what he predicted and what he sees happening. He may be asking things like, why hasn't Jesus set me free? I mean, I am, I'm his forerunner. I'm, I'm the one that goes before and announces him. Why, 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 why have I been forgotten here? Why hasn't he put the, the axe to the root of Herod's evil? That's what John preached out in the wilderness. Why hasn't he done that? Here I am in prison. It's been nearly a year. And Jesus is just wandering around town. Doing miracles. Feeding people. Here I am in prison. Why doesn't he do something about what's going on? Why, why was I forgotten? Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt like you've just been forgotten? You've just been tucked away in some corner someplace? Forgotten? John's been tucked away in prison. And he's not going to get out of it. We know that. He doesn't even know that yet. We know that. It didn't work out the way John thought it was going to. And yet John had served in such a special and such an important way. I don't know if any of you have used uh, Ken Chumley's commentary on Matthew, but I've got a couple quotations here. The first one, uh, uh, again, it's Ken Chumley's commentary on Matthew. And, and I just so appreciate what he says. He says, he says, when fortune is reversed and injustice reigns and righteousness is punished, it's normal to question the things surely believed. Oh, what a great quote that is. Yeah. You know, it's, it's often, I think, difficult for us to see the people in the Bible, like John, as real people. Uh, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. We talked about Elijah just a moment ago. Uh, it's, it's interesting that James, in James chapter 5, he talks about prayer. The prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. And he makes this one comment about, about Elijah when he says that he's a man with a nature like ours. I wonder, why does he say that about, about Elijah? He's a man with a nature like ours. Why, why would he say that? I think what he's saying there is he's not a superhero. We look at Elijah and we see the magnificent things that he does, how, much, how powerful, how, how, how courageous, how bold he is, how devoted he is, and we think there, he must have super faith. And James is simply saying, no, he's just a regular guy. He's a regular guy. All of these people in the Bible, all of the heroes from Hebrews chapter 11, they're all regular people. The Bible is so often... We, 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 we talked a little bit about passion. We talked a little bit about feelings the other day. And I believe that there is, there, there is place, there, there is a place, there is a necessary place for emotion in our faith. But so often we don't read about that because the Bible is often more interested in what people do and not how they feel. But that doesn't mean that they didn't feel all kinds of ways about what they did. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Think about Abraham again. You remember when God calls on Abraham now that he has given him finally, after all of these years, he's finally given him this son of promise. And now God says, you know what, Abraham, I'd like him back. I want you to go up to one of these mountains and there I want you to offer him back to me. 
You think Abraham understands why? Do you think Abraham understands how this is going to work out? Now, you may remember, if you've studied through Genesis before, you may remember that, that Abraham, when he goes up to the mountain, he leaves the servants behind, and he says that the boy and, the, the, the boy and I will go up to worship, and we will return to you. There, there is faith in what Abraham is doing. I got him from the dead in the first place, and so even if God has to raise him from the dead this time, he'll come back with me. This is the son of promise. But I don't know how this is going to work out. But what do you think Abram told his wife? Now that story's not re that, that story's not not revealed to us. But don't you suppose that they had a conversation? Don't, don't you suppose that they might have talked about this? Or do you just suppose that Abraham snuck off before daylight? He just snuck off with Isaac. Didn't tell his mom where they're going. The Bible's interested in what they did, not so much how they felt, but that doesn't mean that they didn't feel something about it. You and I would feel, wouldn't we? We'd feel all kinds of ways about this. If God told you you had to go and do this with your boy that you'd waited all these many years for, or if, you're, if God told your husband to go and do this with your boy, your only boy, the boy that you've waited so very long for, you might have ways of feeling about it, wouldn't you? Yeah, the Bible's interested in what people do and not how they feel, but that doesn't mean that they didn't feel something. Think about David. I, I love this. Philip Yancey in his book, uh, The Bible Jesus Read, when he talks about the Psalms, he makes this comment, and I don't have it quoted here, but he makes this comment that uh, in all the rest of the Bible, it is God speaking down to, to, to man, to mankind, to humanity. But in the book of Psalms, it is where the, the righteous man, the godly man, speaks back, not, not in a rebellious way, but, but speaks back to God, responds to God. And when you read through the Psalms, it is not this even smooth upward trajectory of holiness. And I think the best example is seen in Psalm 22 and Psalm 23. Psalms back to back with one another. These are famous Psalms. What does Psalm 22 begin with? It's the words that Jesus says on the cross. My God, my God. These are the words of David. Yes, Jesus fulfills them ultimately. But these are, these are David's words. David feels this way. Why have you forsaken me? And the next day, I don't know that it's the next day, but it's the next Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. You ever feel like your life goes like that? Up and down, up and down. Peaks and valleys, and one right after another. That's the life of a godly man or woman. Things just don't always work out the way that you expect them to. I think about prophets like Habakkuk and Jonah. Here are men that don't understand what they're seeing. Habakkuk sees all this evil in Judah and he cries out to the Lord, God, how can you endure this evil? And God says, I'm not going to endure this evil. I'm putting a stop to it. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring the Babylonians and they're going to destroy this whole place. And Habakkuk says, well, <laughs> what? Why are you going to bring those wicked heathen people? I know it's bad here, but they're even worse. I don't understand what you're doing. And so he says, I don't understand this. I'm just going to station myself here on my guard post. I'm going to watch and I'm going to see what God does. Habakkuk doesn't understand. Jonah is another example. He doesn't understand. He goes and preaches to Nineveh. They repent. He knew that they were going to repent and then God was going to forgive them because that's what God does. But he doesn't understand why. And the story leaves off with him still pondering it. None of these people were demigods. These people were just regular people. I know that they're the heroes of the Bible story, but they're just regular people like us. They felt all kinds of ways about what God was calling on them to do and what they were seeing around them. But the Bible's interested in what they did. And God's interested in what we're going to do in spite of how we feel. 
And so what does Jesus do when John Doubting asks, are you the expected one or should we look for someone else? What does he do? Look at the next few verses. What does he do? What is Jesus' response? Jesus calls him back to the Bible. When I don't know how I feel about what I'm seeing, when I don't know what to do about what's going on around me, when I don't understand why things are the way that they are, what do you do? Go back to the Scriptures. Matthew chapter 11, verse 4 and 5. Jesus answered and said to them, Go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the, deaf hear the go- uh, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And, he- and blessed is he who does not take offense at me. The prophets predicted all of the very things that Jesus is doing. And, and so Jesus is just simply telling John, go back, or, uh, go back, remember what the Bible says. Just remember what the Bible says. Here's a couple different passages from the book of Isaiah. I like this verse. This, this verse is from the New Testament. This is 2 Corinthians. It's, it's, almost, it's almost like a, well, in, in my text, it's a parenthetical clause. It's, it's surrounded by parentheses. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Things don't look like they ought to. Things aren't working out the way that I thought they were going to. What do you do when you have all kinds of doubts? We walk by faith, not by sight. And faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Go back to the Bible. That's what Jesus tells John to do. And so then Jesus gives a quick warning about that response. And we read this, verse 6. Blessed is he who does not take offense at me. I think the offense is that it do, Jesus doesn't look like what we thought he was going to look. He doesn't do what we thought he was going to do. I think that's where John is, and sometimes that's where we are. What we think it's going to be like when we become a Christian, the way we think our life is going to go, it doesn't always go that way. And so Jesus offers this warning, don't take offense at me. Don't stumble over me. Here's another quote from Chumley from the commentary I mentioned a moment ago. The blessing is to the man who doesn't abandon Christ when he does not, when Christ does not meet our expectations. Absolutely. Somebody says, but a a good God would not take my loved one from me. Have you felt like that? Have you felt like that? I confess to you freely today, I have felt like that. I confess and openly today, I have felt like that. Deep down in my heart, I have felt like that. I know, I know better. I know in my head, I know better than this, but I feel it. A good God wouldn't have taken them from me. Or have you heard something like this? God wants me to be happy. Doesn't God want me to be happy? (laughs) I remember being in high school. I was so interested in this one girl. I went down, visited the church where I knew she worshipped, and I tried to talk to her, and she wouldn't talk to me. And she just, of course, she just wanted to be friends, you know. You know how that goes, right? And uh, I went and talked to the preacher afterwards, and I said, oh, man, I just, you know, said something like this eventually. I said, huh, doesn't God want me to be happy? And you know what his response to me was? There was no compassion in his words. <laughs> you know what his response was? No. Does God want me, God, doesn't God want me to be happy? No. He wants you to be holy. That's what he said. Have you heard words like this? from yourself or from other people. Now if we read on in the book of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 11, some do take offense at Jesus. They stumble over Him when He doesn't meet their expectations. He's doing what He ought to do, 
Don't misunderstand me. He's doing what Jesus ought to do. But he's not meeting what I expected him to do. The problem is my expectations. The problem is my assumptions. The problem is not with Jesus, and the problem is not with the Scriptures. So Matthew chapter 11, now verse 16. I might mention to you, I am not down on John for doubting. Jesus is not down on John for doubting. We skipped over these verses, but the verses that we skipped over are all praise from Jesus about John. Jesus does not see John as weak. As a matter of fact, Jesus says of John, who has just doubted, that of those that are born among women, there's nobody greater than John. John's the best. Verse 16. What shall I compare this generation to? It's like children sitting in the marketplaces who call out to other children and say, we played the flute for you and, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by your friends. When you were a kid, did you ever play wedding or funeral? I can remember when I was over at my grandpa's house one time, me and my cousins, we all found this dead mouse out in the field. Found this dead mouse. We got a box together. We didn't know anything about this mouse except it was dead. We got this box together and we had this big ceremony for it just like this had been some chieftain of our tribe. And we buried this mouse and I don't know, we might have even had like a 21 BB gun salute to send him off, you know, in fashion. Did you ever play wedding or funeral? Did you ever play games when you were a kid? Well, of course you did. Of course. That's what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about children's games. And what happens in children's games? There's one child that just doesn't want to play. If I don't get my way, we're not playing. If you don't play by my rules, then I'll take my ball and I'll go home. You want to play wedding? No, I want to play funeral. Okay, let's play funeral. I don't want to play funeral anymore. That's what's going on here. And isn't it just that silly? Isn't it just that silly? Now, tell me. Tell me and be honest. Well, don't tell me. Just think about this and be honest with yourself. Are we adults anything more than just big kids? Don't we sometimes do that very thing? That's what Jesus is accusing adults of being like. If it can't be your way, you don't want to play. And so Jesus has a pretty strong statement for these kind of folks. Verse 20. Then he began to denounce, he began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracles were done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the miracles had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, and Tyre and Sidon, by the way, is where Jezebel comes from, which occurred in you, they, Tyre and Sidon, would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Nevertheless, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will descend to Hades. For if the miracles that occurred in, you, in Sodom, which occurred in you, it would have remained to this day. Nevertheless, I say to you that it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Now, more tolerable, I, I don't think that he's talking about levels of punishment or levels of paradise. Uh, that kind of question, it, it's beyond my pay grade. Uh, I know that there are people that want to argue that from the Scriptures, and I'll just tell you, I don't know. What I do know is that's not what this verse is talking about. When Jesus says it will be more tolerable, it's hyperbole. He's exaggerating the point to make the point, and the point being that these Jews are not 
right. And so at the end, Jesus offers the great invitation. These are the ones that have rejected. Because Jesus isn't what they expected Him to be. When Jesus isn't what you expect Him to be, when Christianity isn't what you thought it was going to be, when your life doesn't just automatically fly in an upward trajectory, more and more holy, more and more secure, more and more stable, every day progressing upward, when things just don't work out in a smooth pattern like that, don't stumble over Jesus. Because listen, Jesus isn't moving. Don't stumble over the Scriptures. The Scriptures aren't going to change. Change your expectations. And so to those people, Jesus invites. Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, beginning in verse 25 now. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this way was well-pleasing in your sight. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Father, or no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Now, again, don't misunderstand what Jesus is saying. It's not that the intelligent, the wise, it's not that the intelligent cannot know, but you do not need to be a genius in order to understand the scriptures. Matter of fact, sometimes, sometimes the problem is that we just, we just think that we know way more than we really do. Sometimes it's because we've been so successful with people. It's because we've been so successful uh, in, in the world. We've been so successful in business or in, 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 well, maybe it's because our life has succeeded so very well. We've just been on that upward trajectory and nothing seems to hold us back. And so we can't get on board with the things that Jesus talks about. Especially that stuff about the last shall be first and the first shall be last. That kind of backwards thinking. Well, it's backwards to the world at least. It's not that the intelligent cannot know, but you don't have to be a genius to understand the truth. I like to say a little bit more about that, but I'm going to move on because we're about out of time. And I want to get this last point in. Verse 28. Verse 28. Come to me. Jesus, here, here it is. Here's the great invitation. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What makes this invitation so great? It's an invitation to a yoke. It's an invitation to take up a burden. It's the invitation that we talked about on Sunday night to take up your cross. To die to yourself. As Paul says, I die daily. That's the invitation. So what makes it appealing? What makes it so great? It's the character of the one who invites. That's what it is. I'm going to illustrate it this way and I'm going to finish with this. I remember reading this book years ago uh, and maybe you read this in high school or in elementary school or grade school or some, some school. Maybe you've read this before. Maybe you just, maybe you just heard about it, but it's George Orwell's uh, story or, or book called Animal Farm. I was fascinated with that story. I didn't really have any appreciation for what it's about, but I just like the idea of animals taking over the farm. Uh, in, the, in, the story, in the story, the animals take over the farm, right? They throw off the oppressive humans, and they're going to run the farm now for themselves. And everybody's going to be equal. But of course, some are just more equal than others. And up rises the pigs. The pigs are going to be the brains of the operation. But some of the animals are truly committed to it. Committed to the farm. 
and they work themselves to better the farm. And one of the best examples is the great uh, Belgian horse, the boxer. Boxer slaves himself away. He works himself nearly to death to build the great windmill. And then the windmill's destroyed and he slaves again. He slaves away. He gives all of his strength to rebuild the great windmill. And when it is built, and it's built on the back of his strength, and he has no more strength to give. And he assumes, he assumes now, in appreciation for all that he's done for his, for his fellow animals, for the farm, that he'll be allowed to go off to the pasture and enjoy some long-needed rest. And the ones in charge, the masters of the farm, rather than let him go off in peace and enjoy his last few days, when he has no more strength to give, they call the, the knacker to come and haul his near carcass off to wring out what last scrap of value they can get out of his hide. Aren't you glad that you serve the lamb and not the hogs? For I am gentle and humble in heart. That is what makes it a great invitation. And that's the invitation that's open to you tonight. Come. Repent of your sins. Confess this Jesus, this Lamb of God, as King of your life. And follow Him wherever, wherever He leads. Be baptized tonight for the forgiveness of those sins. Come while we stand and sing.